I'm Elvis Mitchell, and I'm here to talk about a lot of the images and poster art, the backdrop for Inglorious Bastards. Um, if you know Quentin Tarantino's work, you certainly know he's a film lover, and there's probably no other movie, action movie in history in which two of the heroes are a projectionist and a British film critic. And movies play a big part in this, this film. Now, of course, the propaganda film in Inglorious Bastards is called Nation's Pride. Um, it takes a real-life figure, uh, at least a real-life figure in the film, Frederick Zoller, who's a war hero, who, as he describes himself, is a German Sergeant York. And also, when he meets Soshana, they're talking about the G.W. Papp's Arnold Frank collaboration, The White Hell of Pitz Palu. It was a movie directed by Arnold Frank, who did a number of films, what they were called German Mountain films. And he starred Leni Riefenstahl and made her a star because she was an athlete in addition to being an enormous film presence. And in this film, which is about a group of people trapped on the mountain, a real-life World War II fighting ace named Ernst Udet plays himself and rescues uh, the people trapped on the mountain. And so that's kind of reflected back. It resonates with Nation's Pride. Now, I, I brought up uh, the White Hell of Pitsparloo because a lot of the imagery, uh, people turned, in fact, Zola in the, the program is turned as very noble profile. He's holding a rifle, has that look of people sort of staring into the sun nobly. That was very much a part of German propaganda films and kind of came out of this weird kind of uh, mountain melodrama romance that the White Hell of Pitsparloo was a big part of. It kind of created its own mythology before World War II, and Goebbels seized on that and further made that a part of the kinds of movies where people triumphing over nature and heroism as destiny were a big part of the way that um, Goebbels viewed propaganda, and that's very much a part of, of nation's pride. And in almost every shot, there's a profile, and the star is gazing nobly, stoically into the camera, and that's what makes it so funny. When Zola's watching the movie, he can't stand it because he realizes he's not only being used as just an image, he's not even a very dramatic image. I mean, there's more drama in the people running away from him shooting them than there is in him just staring, firing away at them. In a way, it's almost like a black and white version of a very primitive video game. One of the funniest images, and I know that Eli Roth, who directed Nation's Pride, took a great deal of pride himself in it, is when he's carving a swastika into a floorboard as he's dispatching hundreds of Allied soldiers. It's really very funny. Again, it just kind of shows that for this quote-unquote character of Zoller, there is no... He has not a single moment's doubt. lobby cards of Nation's Pride. We still get the noble profile, the, the unfurrowed brow, the noble nose, the rifle hanging. Uh, again, it's, it's, it's almost rendered in kind of Wagnerian way where he's a god with a gun. It's these propaganda quote-unquote dramas that Goebbels tried to push, that he not tried to push, he foisted upon the public. There was no gradation. Uh, there was no gray. Literally, black and white was the best medium for them because they were black and white stories. The Nazi would triumph. And that's very clear in the images uh, that were chosen here. And uh, there's one very funny shot that's uh, basically lifted right out of Eisenstein, of a soldier putting his hand toward his bloody face, taking Eisenstein's own use of, of that kind of horror and using it as a way of saying, this is just one more allied soldier who can't stand up to the onslaught of German might. It's interesting because Goebbels maintained that Germans should see all kinds of movies. If, if you'll notice, in fact, at one point, Zola talks about uh, his love of Max Linder, who Goebbels also loves. What's going on after tomorrow? Un festival Max Linder. Oh, j'ai toujours préféré Linder à Chaplin. Goebbels' idea was that you couldn't just make propaganda films. You couldn't just beat people over the head with this kind of intractable propaganda. You had to mix it up a little bit. So when people went to German theaters, which did very well during World War II, interestingly, by the way, they would be shown a light comedy, a musical comedy, a melodrama, and then propaganda films. I mean, Goebbels is very conscious about creating an entire world when people went to the movies just because he wanted to replicate the American system when you saw a documentary, short, a newsreel, a cartoon, and a feature. And 
of course, one of the reasons he wanted to do this kind of thing was because Hitler loved comedy and specifically was a huge fan of Mickey Mouse. So comedy is very important to what Goebbels did for that reason. Fabelhaft, mein Lieber, fabelhaft. If you've heard interviews, Brad Pitt has talked about Tarantino's minute attention to detail. And that's key here because every image selected is in the film four point. The movie posters, the lobby cards, and the theater that Shoshona runs uh, are, are movies that would have been, at that time, very important in Germany or very important to the characters in the movie. Movies are a part of people's lives. Uh, we can use that as a way to segue into some of the other poster art. Um, at one point, um, Lillian Harvey's name comes up in the movie, and Goebbels spits and says, Lillian Harvey, never mention that name to me again. Lillian <laughs> Harvey! Because Lillian Harvey was um, a big star in Germany and helped to sneak um, a famous choreographer out of the country. She was interrogated by the Gestapo for that, and she fled the country. And in 1943, at the point at which Goebbels is introduced in the movie, she has been officially renounced by the Nazi regime. One of the great things about Lillian Harvey was that, you know, it was fascinating that she, and I always wonder that one of the reasons that Goebbels hated her so much was that she did a film called Der Fluch, and she played uh, a Jewish girl, a young Jewish girl, trying to figure out, of course, her way in life, which is what women did because they didn't have jobs in movies for the most part until the 40s. Something about that must have stuck in Joseph Goebbels' craw. It must have been one of the reasons that he had so much animosity toward Lillian Harvey, and just when all these things finally added up, he just thought, I cannot have her as being a part of the Third Reich anymore. There are a number of Henri Georges Clouseau films, I mean, because an incredibly popular and accomplished filmmaker who also did a movie that plays a big part in a very subtle way in this film. At one point, on the marquee outside her theater, Shoshana is uh, putting up Le Corbeau, which means the raven, and is an incredibly complicated film that's also an incredibly complicated story. Uh, a Clouseau film that was made uh, basically German financing, and the film cost him his reputation in France for a number of years. He was banned from making films there because of this film, which in its way seems to kind of attack fascism. It's a film full of secrets and lies uh, about things being kept from people. Clouseau later reclaimed his reputation in France. Uh, he's most famously known now for films such as Diabolique and The Wages of Fear, all films about the moral cost of lies. The Murderer Lives at Number 21, which is another Henri Georges Clouseau film, uh, a kind of minor film of his that has its supporters but has a beautiful, incredibly beautiful poster. And the thing that Clouseau was able to do so beautifully, again, was just, just to deal with those tensions of people trying to figure out where the truth lies and what the relationship to the truth is going to be. And certainly the reason that this film and Le Corbeau are part of the world of Inglorious Basterds is because they very much deal with that subjectivity of truth and about how people keeping secrets and holding parts of themselves away from other people cost them their souls. Domino starring Fernand Gravy, another kind of suave, polished actor who wasn't who starred in a couple of American films, uh, wasn't really able to make things work for himself, but went back and became a war hero. Uh, was supposed to star, I think, in some German finance French films, but became a part of the French Foreign Legion. And after the war was over, became a legitimate war hero who still found a life as a movie star after that was all over. Now, of course, all these posters are from movies that were made and really exist. And unfortunately, many of them are incredibly difficult to find just because the presumption is there's no interest in people seeing these movies again. But the posters for the movies that are impossible to find are, of course, the movies that star Bizet von Hammersmark. And uh, they all have titles like Bitter Tears and are rendered in sort of art that's both like incredibly sort of heavy-handed in that, that way that would reflect Third Reich propaganda. You're always looking directly into somebody's eyes in every one of these things. There's always a gaze on you that says there's a kind of confidence that doesn't quite make sense. I mean, you always feel like these posters are basically peering at you, like there's in one way or another you're seeing Big Brother reflected. It's a really hilarious one, Fraulein Doctor, 
uh, even though she's casting her glance slightly to the ground and trying to look troubled, just the way the jawline is rendered, there's no mistake, and, and all the blonde is visible, that you're looking at the Aryan ideal. You know, the blonde hair, the blue eyes, uh, the fact that even as a suffering Fraulein doctor, she will somehow find a way to win the hearts and minds of every person she ministers to. And and it sort of explains why Bridget von Hammersmark had to become a spy, because she clearly was getting no satisfaction from the kind of movies that she had to star in. Every th image selected, every moment in the film, they're all part of this backstory that Tarantino creates. It has an enormous amount of forethought that's gone into it, because it's all been chosen for a reason. There's no random detail in the movie. As Gables would say, it's all destiny finding heroism.